All right, everyone, welcome back to part three of a three-part YouTube tutorial on building your own home theater Ambilight system. Parts one and two dealt with setting up your Raspberry Pi as well as your Node MCU. Now those were pre-set up with their correct software so that we can integrate them into the full build once this part is complete. If you were just looking for some cool effects behind your TV that you can control with your phone, skip ahead to the wiring and all you need is the Node MCU and a power supply as well as your LED strips. But if you want a fully immersive home Ambilight system, we're gonna need a couple more pieces of hardware besides the Node MCU, the Raspberry Pi, and the LED strip. So the way it's gonna work is you're gonna need an HDMI splitter. The splitter is gonna have input coming from either a fire stick or in my case, an AV receiver, and it's gonna have two outs. The first is 4K going directly to the TV. The second is a 1080 downscaler. Now that is gonna to connect to a 1080 to RCA video converter. This is gonna be used by our RCA USB video grabber. This is going to plug directly into the Raspberry Pi in any of the USB ports. This will allow Hyperion to analyze the signal and send the correct data to your Node MCU. Now, to power my Node MCU, I'm going to be using a 5 volt 10 amp power supply. That isn't going to actually work for everyone. Mine is calculated due to the max number of LEDs I have. All these devices will be linked down below in the description. They will be my exact setup which is great because I know it works. If you need to watch any diagrams, they will be included on my GitHub along with any of the code associated. All right, so if you have all the pieces and you're ready to go, I think it's time to jump right in. Okay, so first things first, let's get some power going to the Node MCU and eventually the LED strips. We're gonna use this five volt female barrel adapter and a five volt 10 amp power supply that will power the Node MCU and our WLED strips. So what I like to do is I like to take the female end of one of these three pin adapters and I am going to splice two wires with pins into the ends of the corresponding wires on the, the female three pin adapter. The red wires are gonna be the five volt power lines. So what I'm gonna do is twist them together in preparation to put some solder flux on them. The white wires are going to be our ground wires, and I'm going to pre-twist those as well. I like to put a little bit of flux on them. And I like to solder them together. It creates a nice little solid connection. And we can go ahead and put that into the positive end of the female barrel adapter and screw it down with one of those little precision screwdrivers. Give it a nice little tug. And that is gonna be our five volt part. Then what I like to do is I take the white wire, which is our neutral ground and just repeat the process. And that one will go into the negative terminal. And we tie that one down. All right. So I mentioned the flip terminals earlier. They're useful for when you want to power individual strips straight from the power source as opposed to having the voltage flow through the line. So what I tend to do is I will use a different flip terminal set for both positive and negative. I'll have a line coming out of positive into a terminal, and then I'll have wires going off to individual strips from there. And then I will have 
a line coming out of the negative going into a second terminal, and then I'll have lines going from its corresponding terminals to the ground on the other strips. But for this sake, what we're going to do is we are then going to take the 5 volt power, and that's going to go to VIN, ground is going to go to ground, and then we take the green wire from the 3 pin adapter, and we put it to D4 on the known MCU. I already put a little solder on and soldered it directly and wrapped it in some heat shrink. Then what we can do is we can get our power supply, and in this case, my 5 volt 10 amp power supply, and plug it in. And we should see the blue light on the Node MCU, which there it is. That takes care of the wiring. Since I have it mounted on this little plate, that makes it easy. I can mount it directly onto the TV. Technically, we should be able to test some LED strips with this right after we start wiring them up. So to finish out the LED construction, we obviously need a few more pieces other than our pre-setup Node MCU. We're going to need our four individually cut LED strips. I will be showing you how I cut them personally in a little bit right after this. Now if you look at the LED strips, they each have a little arrow on them. This is going to tell you the direction of the data flow. So obviously you have data 1, data 2, data 3, and so on. I've already soldered the male end of these cool male-female three-pin adapters that I like to use to connect each strip to each other. We're also going to need a 5-volt 10-amp power supply, 10 amps in my case. Technically, you figure out the amperage based on the number of LEDs you have. You can see in the top left corner that each LED roughly puts out 60 milliamps per so just times 60 milliamps by as many LEDs as you have total, and then divide that by a thousand. We also need our wire strippers. And I like to use these little flip terminals, like I said earlier, some people will use them to power individual strips. I also have some extra 12 gauge wire, my flux paste, and my solder. My trusty soldering iron as well. So Hyperion analyzes the video image coming in from the grabber. A lot of people like to put their LEDs along the entire length of the TV, but I definitely like to measure from one point of the corner to the other. Otherwise you get a sort of distorted image. So I just lay the first one down, stretch it all the way across, and verify, and cut right there. Then what I can do is I can double it up and cut a second strip. Once that's done, I take the second one and go from the other corner to the other corner. And then once that's fully measured out and verified, I'll cut a second strip of the same length. That way we have two pairs of the exact same size. So at this point, what you're going to want to do is you want to count your LEDs. So on the top and bottom, I'm going to have 28 LEDs for a total of 56 on the top and bottom. And then on the left and right, I'm going to have 16 for another 32. So then obviously you take that total jot down the number, which is going to be 88. In my case, it's 88. What I also like to do is solder the male end on the beginning of each LED strip. That way, once I have WLED set up, which we'll do next, we'll be able to test each one individually. So to set up WLED, we're going to want to go to the IP of the Node MCU, which we jotted down earlier as dot .46, and it will load the WLED UI. Since we know we have 88 LEDs, we're going to have to go to config and we're going to want to go to LED preferences. The top one says LED count, change that to your LED count and go ahead and hit save. As a side note, if you add more LEDs, you will have to increase the maximum current. The next thing we're going to want to do is go to our sync interfaces and we're going to want to change the UDP port and verify that it's at 21324. If it is, Go ahead and hit save, and then you can put your node MCU down and off to the side. Alright, since I already have my LED strips with the male ends pre-soldered, I'm going to show you how I go through the female side and then connect them individually to test. Okay, so the way I like to go about this is I will do one end at a time and then connect it to the next strip and verify that everything's up and running. So red to 5 volt. And we want green to data and definitely try not to get the lines crossed. 
And then obviously white to brown. And what we can do is we can start by connecting. So obviously you don't want to do this with them powered. And then you can take the next strip and connect the male to the female you just added. And we can obviously see that the data flow goes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fast forward and go ahead and do the rest of these. And then we will start the Hyperion configuration when we're ready. And obviously the last strip won't need one, so we can go ahead and just wire these. All up. Now I just need to heat up the heat shrink. All right, now that we've got the heat shrink on, I like to test everything one more time just to verify. So we'll go ahead and plug it all back up. And everything's still looking good. So depending on what WS2812B LED strips you get, you might get some with waterproofing and some without. I have one of each here. So what I decided to do was use some electrical tape and just wrap it around a couple times at predetermined points where I have these white clips, which will be linked below, placed around the TV. Nice thing about this is it just thickens where it's holding on to it. So, you know, it doesn't move around like it just did quite a bit. Uh, and it tends to hold it in place and everything looks a lot cleaner and you have no hanging LED strips. Of course, this is all personal preference and just depends on how you want your LEDs to shine on your wall, whether it be facing towards the wall or angled down a little bit with L brackets, you can get creative and make it work. From here on out, just wrap your LEDs around the TV, clipping them into place, and then we can connect them and mount our node MCU to the TV. So I'm going to switch the angle a little bit here just so it's easier to see. I like to place the node MCU in this little pocket right below the video inputs uh, and it just makes it easier. So once we clip it in, you can see that the direction of my LEDs when looking at the TV will actually be counterclockwise. This is very important information for Hyperion as you will have to program this as well as the starting point of your LEDs in the LED configurator. With WLED configured to 88 LEDs and the power working and all our strips connected, you can see that everything's up and running and every single strip works. Next, we will set up Hyperion. So what we're gonna to wanna to do is head to our Hyperion web UI by opening a browser and connecting to our, our Raspberry Pi's IP. In this case, I will be connecting to 192.168.50 dot 17 at port 8090. This will take you to the Hyperion configuration web UI. If this is your first time connecting to Hyperion, you will probably get a pop-up saying the default password Hyperion is set and asking to change. Go ahead and do that. That's what I did. Then go ahead and refresh and log back in if you need to. The first thing we're gonna do is click configuration and go to LED hardware. Now, if you are using WS2812B LED strips like I am, you're going to want to go ahead and set your controller to UDP raw because we're sending the data over the network. The RGB byte order will stay RGB and our target IP is actually going to be the IP of your node MCU. So in this case, it's 192.168.50.46 for me. And you also want to make sure that your port is going to be 19446. At this point, we're going to want to save our settings and click LED layout at the top. This is where the direction of your LED strips, as well as the number per side, is going to come in very important. My personal config will eventually show 28 on the bottom and top, as well as 16 on the left and right. 
what we need to do is we need to match those entries on the left side. And you, as this happens, you can see the picture changing, which is great. But the problem is at the top left is where it actually thinks it starts. But my personal configuration is going to start on the bottom left and go the opposite direction. So what we need to do is we need to count the total top, the total right, and the total bottom. Add that up, and that's going to be 72. I actually thought it was 74 at first. And then we're also going to want to go ahead and click reverse direction. You can see the black is where it starts and the gray is the direction it's going to be following. So it's a really handy guide. Once that's done, go ahead and hit save layout and refresh the page just to verify everything got saved. And you should be good to go. Now there are a bunch of other settings you can look into as in depth, which will actually try and analyze more of a picture and change your RGB. Uh, settings for each individual LED. This is where things start to get really tricky and really only works when you're playing around while actually watching something. The last and most important part is we want to make sure that USB capture is enabled. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to configuration and we're going to go to capturing and we're going to check this box right here if it isn't. If it isn't, go ahead and check it, save it, and call it good. It's time putting everything together and getting to see the fruits of your labor. Now I'm usually pretty big about cable management and right now it's a mess, but for the purpose of this tutorial, it's totally okay. But I will show you how everything works. So we have our video in, and which in my case is an Amazon Fire Stick 4K, and that's going to my HDMI splitter. In my case, the left side is 4K out and that's going directly to the TV, and the right side is the 1080 downscaler. This little HDMI cord is going to our HDMI to RCA converter. The video out on the RCA side is going to the USB grabber on our Raspberry Pi. Since we have USB capture enabled, everything's up and running, it's all plugged in. Let's go ahead and turn on the Pi. When Hyperion starts, we should see a rainbow swirl around the TV, and then we should be able to see the colors working. So we'll turn this one on. I'm going to get out of the way and let it focus. It is going to take a second, so we'll just sit and wait. All right, so that means Hyperion has started. Now what we want to see, OK, green on the top. We have a little bit of color on the bottom. Let's turn off the light and let's go ahead and play and see if everything works. All right, folks, that's what we want to see. Okay, so the colors look great. You can see it's completely responsive to everything going on. Now, some of you might have a little bit of an awkward color on here, like your blues might look a little more teal or your purples might look a little more red. What you can do is there's a setting, and I'll have it in, the, I'll have it in that corner, <laughs> where you can change the gamma and you can go up and down, anything over one removes a little bit of that color from the RGB. So thank you so much everyone for watching. Please leave a comment if you have any questions, any concerns, if you think there's a better way to do this. I will definitely be uploading another version, just a demo when I get the HDMI grabber to see how everything's working. Uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure guys, thank you so much. I hope you enjoy.